All right, everyone, thank you very much for coming out here to the Sheraton to learn about Windows IoT. I appreciate it. I'm James Colas, and with me is Shrag Shah. And for the next 75 minutes, we're going to do the thing that we enjoy most, and that is talk about Windows IoT. Hopefully, that will be enjoyable for you as well. So let's get right into that. Yes, I already said who we were. If you caught Sam and Rushmi and Galen's talk about Microsoft IoT in general, this may be familiar. If not, I recommend you go back and check out the recording for kind of an overall view of Microsoft IoT. And we're going to go into the Windows side. And so as a commercial IoT device maker, when I go to make a device, I have what we call a hierarchy of needs. And it, it's, it's based on the psychological hierarchy of needs, and that is I need a place to sleep before I worry about getting that next promotion. Okay, and so we have to get the fundamentals right, and then we work up to the reasons that we all do this and make a commercial IoT device. And so I'm going to walk through each one of these, give a demo along the way, and then I'll finish with a demo on how Windows IoT can be used for edge intelligence in an industrial setting. And I'll show off my little friend here, and we'll kind of go through how the Windows AI platform really shines on Windows IoT using Azure ML. Now, before I get too deep into this talk, I just wanted to level set what the two different editions of Windows 10 IoT are. We have Windows 10 IoT Core, which is aimed at small devices. I'm going to steal Shrog's thunder here, small device uh, here, with uh, you know, 512 megs of RAM, a small amount of storage, and running on ARM32, yet still having a whole Windows UI surface to program against. And then we have Windows 10 IoT Enterprise, which is Windows 10 Enterprise that we all know, designed for fixed device situations. And that has all the power and then, of course, some of the requirements of Windows as well from a hardware perspective. So we'll kind of go back and forth between talking about those. But those together are the Windows 10 IoT Edition family. So I'm going to hand it off to Shirag now. And he'll talk us through long life silicon and our OS. So thank you, James. So when we spoke with folks last year, um, there were three things we really heard from, from uh, the developers. First thing we heard, people said they need better hardware. They need longer life silicon, longer life solutions that they can build for both commercial and industrial solutions. And so we responded to that. We took that feedback in. And we've enabled Windows IoT Core on NXP silicon, on the IMX6 and IMX7 family. These are two of the most popular industrial silicon, provider, uh, silicon solutions that's available in the market today. And we're happy to announce that uh, Windows IoT Core is supported on these platforms and is available for preview right now. Next thing you told us was, great, hardware is wonderful, but I need to make sure these devices are secure. These devices are going to be lasting a long time in the field. They're going to be running in factories and, and nuclear power plants and you know, my house or wherever else. And I don't want to have that thing going and, and failing on me. So we've enabled 10 years of security updates on Windows IoT. Both editions, 10 years security. You're going to be able to make sure that that device is always secure and stable for your, for your usages. And final thing customers told us was, great. Updates are great. Security updates are wonderful. But I need to control that. I run this in my factory, I run this wherever it is, and I need to decide what the content of that is and what the timing of that release is. So what we've done is that we have enabled our, we've used a Windows update infrastructure and made that available to you. So you'll be able to send out not just OS updates, but also updates of your own components, your applications, your drivers, your files, whatever else you need through the Windows update infrastructure globally. So let's talk about these in a little bit more detail. First, the hardware piece. So we started and we worked with our original partners that we started with in, in the Windows IoT ecosystem from a few years ago. With Qualcomm, we worked with them, and Qualcomm has made the process easier to build with their systems. They've enabled a public BSP access for their, for their BSP for Windows. They've improved manufacturing processes and documented those to make them more complete so you can actually go to scale with, with the Qualcomm solutions in a much easier time frame. And they've also done things where they've improved the BSP itself. 
They've taken feedback from customers. They've taken the feedback to say, we need better display outputs. We need better audio capabilities on the system. And they've improved that in their BSP, which has enabled them to take Windows IoT Core into markets that we haven't been in before. So low cost digital signage, digital signage solutions that are now sub $100 with Windows IoT Core and Qualcomm solutions. It's a real innovation that we've seen a lot of positive feedback on. With Intel, they're one of the strongest partners in the portfolio of, of Windows solutions. And we delivered on a promise with them that we made last year at Build, which said that we were going to expand the Intel ecosystem of silicon across their entire portfolio of, of products, right? So from their i3, i5, i7 to their Atom solutions and, and Celeron and Pentium solutions. And we've done that. We've started and we've, we've completed the work on the low cost silicon solutions and the low power silicon solutions from Intel. So the Braswell and Cherry Trail solutions are now supported on, on IoT Core. And we went ahead and we also worked with the ecosystem. We worked with partners like Aeon that have developed the UpSquared board. The UpSquared board is a development board that customers use for both prototyping as well as production devices. And those solutions are used by over 150 different, in, by developers in over 150 different countries. Very popular solution for x86, x64 development, and we're proud to say that that's supported on IoT Core and available today. And finally, with Raspberry Pi. The Pi has been a success in ways that we didn't even imagine on Windows. We thought it was going to be used for developers and people to just start playing out in, in marketing and makers. And what we found is that a lot of people want to use the Pi. They want to use this board, this device, $35, and be able to deploy that into solutions that they hadn't had connectivity before, they hadn't had intelligence on before, and add that capability with a device that they can use for prototyping or they can sometimes use in production. We have customers that are using this to control solar arrays, that are using this to do things on, um, on large equipment um, across industrial as well as uh, commercial environments. So people took this board. They said, this board's great. But you know, I need a little more customizability on this. So we also enabled Windows IoT Core on something known as the SOM. So you can see the size difference between these two devices. And you can see this one here, the system on module, gives you all the power of the Raspberry Pi 3, but you get to control the I.O. You get to control how many pins of, of GPIO you want, how many pins of SPI you want coming out of this thing. And you get to make that and make that into a more custom device to fit the form factor as well as the capabilities you need for that solution. And in addition to that, we heard a lot of feedback when, since the Raspberry Pi 3B Plus came out this March that people that were using it with Windows wanted it to support. They used it on the previous editions of, of Raspberry Pi. They wanted to use it on 3B Plus. So we're glad to say that that's going to be available coming soon, that we have stuff in the works. Our developers are finishing up some, some activities on it. And it'll be released probably later this month if everything goes right. So that's our existing partners. We also worked with NXP, which I mentioned earlier. Now, NXP is a solution that gives a broad range of capabilities for Windows. Um, their IMX6 and IMX7 family are used extensively throughout the industrial and commercial environments. And these devices range from small, low-cost devices that can work on wearable solutions to more powerful quad-core solutions that are available as well. And these things cost less than a cup of coffee, right? So cheap devices that you can use that have low power requirements, high performance capabilities that give you lots of flexibility in the solution. With that, since we launched this at the end of February, we've had hundreds of partners come in and start evaluations on this platform. These are over half of them have never had a relationship with Microsoft before. That means that it's opened up Windows to an entire ecosystem of partners that have never worked with Windows and Microsoft before. It's a great expansion of the opportunity. And 80% of these customers are coming in because they need cloud connectivity. They want the ease of Windows that helps them to connect to the Azure cloud and capabilities that that provides. And so we're really excited to see what that's bringing in. Moreover than just adding more I.O. capabilities and, and feature and price options for, for developers, one of the things I really like about the work that we're doing with NXP is that there's a, I feel like there's a shared company ethos with them. They are working, and NXP is, is almost synonymous with security. They, they work on the smart cards and the, and the solutions you have in your, uh, in your credit cards. That little chip that's there, that's all NXP technology. They're kind of built on this idea of, of security. 
And with Windows, we've been able to work and unlock unique capabilities of that platform. There are solutions like TCPS and Trusted I.O. These are capabilities that we've enabled with NXP, and you can find out more about them in the security talk that happens tomorrow. Um, it's an IoT security breakout session that happens tomorrow morning, um, which I'd encourage you to attend to learn more about some of these capabilities. But this entire NXP solution is in private preview right now. It'll be commercially available this fall. So if you want to get started with that today, there are options. So if you've got a solution and you're looking for, well, I want to evaluate it, I want to get started, I want to try this out, what we have is we've worked with a, with a few of our different partners in the ecosystem, and they've all built hardware that works with Windows IoT Core. So these solutions you can purchase today. You'll be able to get up, running, and get going with the solution in, in a, just a few minutes. And a lot of these are, you have things that are like boards, you know, a pre-configured solution like the Raspberry Pi 3, or you also have a lot of them that are SOMs, these system on modules that give you all the flexibility, like the Compute Module 3. And that gives you a lot of options on what you decide to do when you finally take the solutions to commercialization. Folks like Solid Run have actually worked, and they have taken the solution, and they have a board available, Windows IoT Core with the developer edition of that solution in IMX, pre-installed on that solution. You purchase this piece of hardware, unbox it, in two minutes you're up and running, you've got your Visual Studio on your dev machine, and you can start deploying applications to the device. It's really simple to get started, really simple to start working with this capability. But let's say, like a lot of people, because IMX is a popular piece of hardware that's available in the marketplace, you've already got your own design. You've got a piece of hardware you're already working with, and you're not going to use one of these commercial boards. So if you've got that, we have a private preview available right now. You go to the URL there, aka MS IoT NXP, and you can sign up for that. We'll get you access to the, to the solution, join the hundreds of others that are working on that solution right now, and you'll have free access to the source code to the, for the BSP, be able to customize it for what you want to do for your device, and be able to try that out on your existing piece of hardware if you have that. And if you don't want to bother with NDAs and that sort of thing, we do have the public preview of that that will be available this summer. So the entire thing is there. It's in a GitHub repository. You'll be access to that GitHub repository and be able to see, contribute code back to it, or just use the code and test it out and see what makes sense for your product. But you know, that's what we said with, with IMX. You don't just have to have IMX solutions. We have these developer board solutions and capabilities available on Intel, on Qualcomm, and the Raspberry Pi solutions as well. So if you go to the, our website, windowsondevices.com, and you press the Getting Started button, which is a big prominent link right on the front of that page, you will be presented with a list. And on that list, you will see developer platforms from all of our different partners. And Intel-based, Qualcomm-based, Raspberry Pi-based, NXP-based. And with these solutions, you can get information more about those products. You can go, you can purchase those hardware right from that website. And you can also download an image that you can load onto that device. So you can get up and running and started with the solution in a few minutes. That lets you go from a concept to production and solution on that in a very quick amount of time, which is really what you want to do. Because when you have an idea, you don't want to be stuck trying to wait and see, OK, wait, I've got to go find one thing I don't have or do something else. You've got the image. You've got everything there ready to roll and ready to get started with. But you know, when you commercialize, one of the things we talked about was we want to give you guys the flexibility, right? Your time is valuable. Your capabilities are valuable. And these you know, six devices here, they may not be the form factor you want. They may have the wrong I.O. You, than you need, right? You may want more GPIO ports. You may want, you know, uh, in, you know in some solutions, we have uh, uh, audio jacks available. In some cases, you might want HDMI output. You might want DVI output. You might want something else on the system. You just might want the board to be red instead of green. Whatever you want, there's options to customize that solution. So you have access to not just these six developer boards, but an entire family of solutions that you can go customize with. So when you go on that Windows on Devices website, you'll be able to see a full list. This is just a sample of that list, but you'll be able to see a full list of hardware that's available, all Azure certified, that you can go and purchase and start using on your devices right now. And if you decide that even these devices are too much for you, that you, you need something even more specific than what's presented here, 
you have the ability to go and, um, and customize and use your own solutions. So Intel, Qualcomm, NXP, Raspberry Pi, all together, there are thousands of different hardware options you have that you can run Windows IoT Core on. You are not limited on your solution, and hardware should never be the reason you decide not to use Windows. If it is, let me know. I will fix that. That's a promise. So the next thing we talked about was security for the device. So we talked about this idea that you have a device. It's going to be in production. You have it on a robot arm. You have it in a factory, wherever it is. You want to make sure that device is secure and stable for a long period of time. So in the fall of this year, we already have a solution called an LTSC, a long-term support channel. This channel provides you security updates without the need to take feature updates on your platform. What this means is that if you have a, a device that's deployed in the marketplace, you don't want to have extra things that may disrupt the image, that may disrupt the type of, of device and capability you've built. You want to minimize that, but you want to have security. So with the LTSC updates, you will have security-only updates that are available to you to deploy at your, at your need. This means that for IoT Core, we'll have that starting with the RS5 release. With IoT Enterprise, we already have that with our RS1 release that's, that's already in market right now. So we'll be having that, and it'll be the same policies for support that you've had on Windows Server or Windows Enterprise already. And because we said silicon is not going to be the issue, hardware is not going to be the issue, you can see here a full list of the hardware that we currently have enabled that will be supported on that RS5 or the fall release of Windows. Final thing you told us, you said you need more control. You want to know when these updates are going to go to your device, and you don't want an update coming down at the wrong time. You don't want to have, and you need the ability for that update to include your workloads, not just the stuff that Microsoft wants to provide. You need to have your own, self, your own elements coming in through this. So we're happy to announce that right now we have a private preview of something we call our device update center. This solution is a capability that gives you the ability to leverage the Windows update infrastructure for your devices, for your capabilities, for your own files and information. So you will have updates, and you'll have the ability when you use this solution to decide and customize the timing, the frequency, and the content of the updates that go down to your devices. And you will be in control of that through different flight rings and be able to go and present the capabilities of these additional features, test them out as they roll out to larger, larger sets of customers. So, Let's walk through a little bit of a demo on this. Now, my goal was here today to actually show you guys the live system, but it's kind of in, in work, and there are a couple of stages that happen in this where it takes some time to go through, where the system actually validates the information and the packages you send up to it. So we're going to go through it with a, with a PowerPoint slides um, that will show you the, the end flow of what this is going to look like. So as we come into this, when you log into the Device Update Center, it'll be a unique portal that's available for you. And when you come into that device update center, you'll see that there are basically three steps in that process. The first step, you provide some information about your device. Second, you go and you set the package. What do you want to update on that system? Right? And finally, you go and you decide when those updates are going to be deployed to your systems. So let's say I am Contoso Corp, and I'm going to make my little device here. Right? And this is a ubiquitous black box. It's red in this case. but black box, play with me. Um, and that solution, we've gone, we've built the solution. It's been out in market a few months. And now we realize, oh, wait, there's a bug there. We've gotten some feedback from customers. They actually want a little bit different capability. They want the UI to be different. They want some other information in that solution. How do I get this out there? This has been sold in whether it's 200 or 2 million devices around the world. How do I get updates out to my customers? I'm not going to give them a USB stick and say, download this and update your device. Right? That's a horrible customer experience. I want to be able to go and get this out to them in whichever way they want to. So let's go and continue and, and see what we do. So first thing we want to do on our device, we're going to go and we're going to tell the system about that device. We're going to go in and we're going to say, here's our device update center. Let's click our new device. And we update some information. We're going to enter in some information about the name of that device. And we're going to update a, a manifest file. This is produced when I built my, my image for my device. I've got a manifest file that's already self-produced out of that solution. I just drag and drop it in. 
less error, less chance for me to make mistakes on what I, what I present to the solution. I go ahead, I've got that device, I got the confirmation of the capabilities I'm putting into that device, and I go next. There it is. I select the device, and now I can see I've got an OS version, and I've got my own custom package that's available on that device. I know what's information is on that device right now, and I see that I've got three different flight rings. I've got rings that I can go to that go from a preview ring, which is a few you know, dozen people, maybe in my, in my own building, my other engineers to test out the system. I've got an early adopter ring. This can be a few hundred. Think of them like insiders, like how Windows has insiders. This is your insider ring to release to. And then you have a general availability ring. This is the mass public that the system is going to go out to. You get to define those rings, and you get to put them there in those three categories. And you can see that there's a new OS update available as well for that, for that device that you've built. So now I'm going to go, and I'm going to go and say, let me put my, my submission together. And similar to what I had before, I'm going to have a solution that goes and tells me, OK, put my information in there. I'm going to upload a, a cab file that gives all my information about the updates, the changes I've made. Right? That'll tell the system when I go and process that. It'll go and tell it, OK, I've got an update here. I've got a new revision version. And as I press that, I get that system loaded. The system is going to go through. It's going to basically do a diff between the original image that was put on the system, all the original files that were there, and these new files. And it's going to figure out that difference package of what it's actually going to shoot out to the devices when I go and deploy them in the ring. It's going to make it so that you don't have to go and send a full, you know, if your device was, uh, let's say, a three gig image of files and applications and information, you don't have to blast three gigs down to that device. If it's a 20 meg update of, of stuff that's changed, only 20 megs goes down to the device. It makes it really easy so that you control how much update is having to go down to the system. You go through now. I click the setup, and I set my ring. I basically say, great. I've got something. I want to send it into my preview ring. I want to select, and I want to do an OS update. And I also want to do an update of my own apps and packages. I've got that solution, and I've got it ready to go. If I didn't want to do an OS update and I just wanted to update my packages, I could. If I wanted to do both, I can do that as well. In this case, we go ahead, we send it through. And now, when this update, when this device goes and scans the Windows update system next time, it'll know that, hey, I'm on a preview ring. There's an update waiting for me. And that update will get shipped down to this device. Easy peasy, you're done. Your device is updated. And as this gets better and you test that preview, you can then roll it out to the future rings as you need to. So we talked about three things today. We talked about that real foundation of the pyramid that James spoke about earlier. You have long life hardware. You've got the capability of 10 years of security updates for your devices. And you've got this device update center that's going to be available for you guys to preview starting in July. So let me hand things back to James. We can do that at the end. All right, thank you, Shrag. And just a piece of advice uh, for other speakers out there, try not to walk next to the speaker when you're mic'd up. So just a little piece of personal advice there. Uh, so all right, great. So uh, Shrag walked us through the foundation of the pyramid. Now we can walk up a little bit and talk about security and manageability. This is something that we hear from customers quite a bit of, as a value of running Windows in their IoT solutions. And so I want to talk about manageability first. There are really two different ways that devices are managed, and that tends to depend on the context of the device and how you're selling it and how you're buying it. So I'm going to start with Azure Device Management first. This is typically used as an OEM. So let's say I'm going to make a thermostat or a piece of conferencing room hardware. I'm going to sell that into an enterprise. The enterprise customer doesn't want to mess with it. If the thermostat's not working, they want to call the thermostat people. They don't want to go fiddle with that and debug it. So it's going to be the thermostat maker in that case who may have hundreds or thousands of customers themselves with hundreds of these. So they're really interested in managing these at scale across multiple customers. And that's where someone is going to use Azure device management to manage those devices. On the other hand, 
if I'm purchasing something, a computer that I'm going to use in my own environment, let's say a cash register. If I'm going to get a cash register, I'm going to make a bunch of changes in that that suit my environment, and then my IT department is going to want to manage that. They're going to want to be able to check its health. They're going to want to be able to push certificates. They're going to want to have it look just like any other PC on their network, and they can do that with a Windows device using any device management MDM client or preferably Windows Intune. Uh, that, that is our recommended path. Either way, it comes down to the same layer on the system that manages these things out of the box and ready to go. Dis despite whichever Windows device you choose, a small device, a medium device, or a large device, it's all going to work and be built on the same platform. So what we have today is Azure Device Management works great on IoT Core, and Intune works great on IoT Enterprise. And of course, we are announcing that we're filling in the box. And so now on IoT Core, Intune Management is available as well, and Azure Device Management will work on IoT Enterprise as well. So whichever size of device you like, whichever preference that you have for how you want to manage the device, Windows is going to support you. Again, we care a lot about manageability, uh, both in the enterprise and in broad scale devices. Uh, I'll also talk a bit about security. I'm actually not going to spend a lot of time on this because, as Shrag said, uh, Torsten and Eustace have a talk uh, tomorrow at 11.15 AM where they will go deeply into this. But let me assure you that we take security really seriously when we put together Windows. We have a team of security experts always on the lookout for what is that next exploit. So we're looking to protect your data before anyone gets to it. We're looking to detect if an exploit was used. And we're looking to remediate to fix the problem, maybe even before you know it, uh, afterward. And so this is our kind of matrix of security offerings, like I said, that I will uh, definitely be showing you, or sorry, Torsten uh, will be going a bit deeper into that. I, I'm going to skip this to stay on time. The next thing I want to talk about as we move up the value chain is the ability to make a device that has some rich functionality in it with Windows. And this is a reason that you would choose Windows for your operating system on your device. I'm going to run through a few examples of devices, and then I'll run through some examples of code, and then I'll even show a little bit uh, as well, as long as my machine is still going to be with me. All right. Pardon me. So uh, speaking of thermostats, you know, JCI Glass it came out at CES and won some design awards with their solution. Again, this is a great reason to use the Windows uh, UI that platform that we have. Misty Robotics also came out at CES and got a, a lot of real strong combination there. They're running Windows IoT Core on their main board. And uh, Misty 2 is coming out shortly. It's actually down on the expo floor if you want to check it out. Uh, Keith and Cope made this great cocktail booster. I tried to bring it in here so that we could give out cocktails, but someone got in the way of that. Um, and so uh, it's pretty cool, though, uh, you know, mix your cocktails with your Windows IoT. I need one in my office, actually. Uh, we just went over to the Han Hanover Messe show in Hanover, and uh, Rockwell Automation uh, made a big bang out there with their automation solution. So they can automate across multiple devices. And then, of course, they have UI that they can check into and get their BI out of everything that's happening across the system. We were at the Digital Sign Expo recently. Our customers were. And a lot of our customers there really appreciate Windows. We had a number of these small devices here announced. And this is a great place for Windows IoT Core because this particular device is going to come in about an $80 price point. And for a digital sign environment where six or $700 may be the norm for a PC, that's a great benefit of Windows IoT Core. Uh, I think Logic Supply also announced some IoT Core-based offerings uh, at that show. It's kind of an example of the things that customers are doing with this. Generally speaking, I have a list here of, of, re of, of devices that you might gravitate toward Windows on. You know, if you have a screen, you've got microphones or speakers or music players, or you have a digital sign, or maybe an ATM, financial devices, cameras. These are things where you're going to need to pull together pieces if you're going to do this using an open source solution where the 
software to handle all this is there, and it's there for 10 years and updated and secure the whole time. An example of some of that software and stacks that are just there, right? We have speech runtime. We've got a great UI platform, pen, touch. I was at the dentist office the other day, and she did imaging on my mouth. And then she could pull up the image right there and touch it and spin it and bring up a keyboard and annotate it. That was all running Windows. It's the kind of thing that uh, the maker of that device just has all this stuff built in and ready to go. Uh, you know, a lot of these stacks take some real work to pull together in an open source solution. So uh, that's something that's there. A couple more examples of that to drill into. The speech platform is a good example. You know, we have a lab of people that do speech stuff that you can turn to if you're putting together a speech solution. We've got support. We've got tools that are there to help. Um, you know, a lot of devices get made with the speech platform. And, you know, there's a beam forming and multi-channel echo cancellation. There's so many things that are there that if you're trying to put together an audio solution, it takes some real work to get that right. Well, again, we have a team of audio experts that worry about this stuff and say, hey, how can I source where uh, all these microphones are finding the current speaker, for example, uh, the current person speaking? That's all there, right there in Windows. And, uh, and so we, we think that's a good benefit. Uh, here's another example. This is something that uh, this was released in this current version of Windows that just came out, the April 2018 edition. This is a camera barcode reader. And we heard a lot of positive feedback from this when we were in Hanover as well, talking to point of sale folks. And what you, it allows you to do is take any camera, plug that in, and the decoder is built into Windows. I feel like I keep saying this over and over again, backed by 10 years of support. It's in Windows. It's going to be secure and stay secure. It supports all these common uh, symbologies here. And we've got docs and sample code. I'm actually going to walk through some code uh, in a second here, because what would be a build talk without at least a little code? Uh, and again, my example here is this is how easy it is to just pull in something and make a Windows device out of it. Um, so uh, I'm going to show you what I have here, and I'm going to ask Dave over here. I probably should have given him just a little bit of warning that it was about to be his turn <laughs> um, to come and give you a little close-up of what we have going on here. I'm actually going to have you do this stuff uh, for this one. So this is, uh, this is any camera. I uh, just got this camera. What's that? Oh, yes, of course. I have to pop over to the camera input. So you can see what we see. Very good. Here is a just this is a regular camera, nothing uh, too special. It's one of our Microsoft Life Cams that uh, that can be picked up really easily. And then I'm going to show you a couple things. Shrog talked about the up squared board, so I bought brought one of those, and it has a QR code on the back, so that'll be easy to scan that. And that's good, yeah. And then. I brought a map with a, uh, a barcode on that. And then I do have to plug Digimark. So uh, this is a piece of packaging. You'll notice it has a barcode on it. But actually, I'm going to scan this side. And this side will also pick up the barcode. And this is Digimark's technology that allows a barcode to be anywhere. So Digimark actually integrated that for us. So thank you very much, Dave. I appreciate that. And I'm going to switch over to my other PC. Awesome, thank you. So let's do this. So uh, my message here is how easy it is to add in a piece of functionality into a Windows device solution using one of our APIs. So this is a sample for the barcode scanner. This is up on GitHub um, right now. I think it got released. If not, in the next couple days, uh, this is going up. And so this is a sample I'll show you in a second. And so the first thing I have to do is I have to bring in my namespace, of course. And then I'm going to get all of the devices that support the barcode scanner. And I'm going to create a little watcher for each of those. And you'll see I'll have an event when that watcher comes active. And of course, that will fire the watcher at an event, at which point I will add the barcode scanner to my UI. So I can select, in this case, which barcode scanner I want. Uh, then when the user selects a scanner, what will happen is I'll come in here and I will claim that scanner to say, yep, that scanner, I'm going to use that one. And then I want to show a preview of it. And that's just as easy as getting the video device ID 
for the scanner. And then I'm going to pump that into my start media capture, which is also in the sample. It just takes that device ID and, and builds a frame for it and puts it on the UI. And then finally, I have a data received event that's going to fire when the camera actually finds the image. And from that, I will extract the various pieces that I need. And I'm done. I have a solution that brings in the barcode scanner. Like, how easy was that? So let's see if this will work here. So let's do this. So I need my barcode. Shoes my camera. There I am. Hello. All right. I tested this in the lighting before. We'll see if it works. Maybe Tony will have to come up with his with his phone. Here. Yes. All right, Tony, you want to help me with the light? Oh, wait. Hold on. First, be smart enough to hit the software trigger button. There it is. Okay. And trust me that that is the, the encoded label there. Let's do this. Let me try it without you first. There, yeah, just like that. Uh, and then here is my Digimark box with no barcode visually on it. And come on. All right, let's try the light. There it is. Okay, picked up 527. So that picked up uh, the scan, the number there uh, changed on the bottom. And so that is an example of. Uh, the camera barcode scanner that's just right there in Windows. And the reason I show that and talk like this is, again, just to get across point, all those technologies that I showed earlier um, are right there in Windows. So that's pretty cool. Again, big thanks to the Digimark guys for contributing that to Windows. Okay. All right, um, so now that's the experiences there. Now I want to talk about the edge and how Windows IoT makes the edge really valuable. And I'm going to ask Shirag to help me out on this next piece here. You got your mic back on. So you waited until you were past the speaker before you turned on your mic. That was the way to do it. Good. All right. Nice hat, by the way. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is the work of Randall Munro, better known as XKCD.com. And this comic, I think, does a pretty good job kind of drilling into the value of microservices and module-based computing. And it may be hard to read all this really quickly in a presentation, so Shirag and I are going to do a dramatic reenactment of it uh, to help you through that. So let's go. Man, Docker is being used for everything. I don't know how I feel about it. Story time. Once, long ago, I wanted to use an old tablet as a wall display. I had an app, and I had a calendar, and a web page that I wanted to show side by side. But the OS didn't have split screen support. I wasn't using Windows. So I decided to build my own app. I downloaded the SDK, registered as a developer, got the IDE, read the samples and the docs. And then I realized how much easier would it be to get two small phones on eBay and glue them together. On that day, I achieved software enlightenment. But you never learned how to write software. No, I just learned how to glue stuff together that I didn't understand. I, OK, fair. All right. Thank you, Shirag. <laughs> um, all right. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Good job. Shirag did it all. Uh, all right, so what's the point? It actually took me about five times reading that, which tells you I'm not the smartest person in this room. Um, of reading this in order to get it. But this is what microservices can do for us. It means we don't need to understand every piece of software. If we build our solution out of microservices that we pull together from eBay or perhaps the Azure Marketplace, then we can use those in our solutions and just add the piece where we're adding value. And we did announce that the Azure Marketplace is going to support Azure IoT Edge modules. Uh, recently. And so now again, I just write my part and I get the parts that I don't want to have to figure out and then I glue them together using Azure IoT Edge. Um, so we'll look at the uh, Azure IoT Edge architecture. And this is a standard diagram here. So it envisions a, a factory where I'm pulling some sensor data off into my solution. But those boxes on top represent Azure IoT Edge modules 
I could have gotten those on eBay or Marketplace, and then I just add the pieces that I need and send the stuff out of that to the cloud that I need. So microservices to Docker are normally used for building cloud solutions. Well, the Edge allows us to take that same cloud programming model and bring it out to the Edge where I can do it in an environment where I control the cost and I control the bandwidth and everything about it. So it takes, lets me take that cloud programming model and bring it in. So super helpful. Uh, so, you know, briefly I'll say this about uh, Azure IoT Edge and Windows. You know, Windows does support Azure IoT Edge. There are a handful of modules out there now that are configured to choose from. There will become more as people are able to write their own modules and put it up on the Azure Marketplace. Right now on Windows, this does run on X64, and ARM32 is absolutely in the roadmap. And then this fall, We'll come Azure ML on that, and, that, and that's, where, uh, that's where we'll demo coming next on this. I just want to give one example of this. Uh, this is a piece of uh, programmable logic controller, I think. Jason will nod if I'm right. Uh, and that will tell me if uh, this will be put into a factory and will be used to do predictive maintenance and, and run, it's still run the entire thing on Azure IoT Edge to both monitor and control uh, my hardware that's in that factory. And so here to tell us more about this is going to be Rashmi. High performance, high throughput production systems in manufacturing involve expensive and critical systems and components. Predicting machine and component failure is critical in minimizing downtime and costly replacements. Beckoff, an industrial automation and control systems leader, is a long-standing partner of Microsoft. Leveraging their unique TwinCat solution for real-time workloads and Azure IoT Edge, Beckoff and Microsoft collaborated on a hybrid solution for predictive maintenance, leveraging both the intelligent Edge and the intelligent cloud. For the Edge part of the solution, Tetra Pak uses a Beckoff industrial PC as well as the automation software TwinCat. TwinCat provides an easy-to-use development interface which is based on Microsoft Visual Studio. This allows to efficiently create and develop automation projects which can be based on open standards like domain-specific languages or standards like C++. Additional functionalities like storage and database services, real-time data processing or analytics services enable our customers to handle all the necessities of an automation project. In addition, TwinCat includes software plugins which enable our customers to connect their machine application with the Microsoft Azure Cloud in order to benefit from what the Azure ecosystem has to offer. With Azure IoT Edge and TwinCat running on the same gateway, Beckhoff was able to create a hybrid solution to manage and perform analytics on high throughput data locally with minimal latency on their customer's premise, whilst taking summarized data back to Azure Cloud for further analysis. Such model-based analytics was perfect for Tetra Pak, a leading process and packaging solution provider that needed to perform quality and performance monitoring for benchmarking and failure prediction. Filling machine behind me can produce close to one million of these packs per day. Hence, maximizing its uptime is one of our customers' main concerns. Our customer's dream is basically to be able to predict when the filling machine key components need to be replaced to avoid any unplanned outage. Today, the Tetra Pak Beckhoff partnership provides benchmarking and failure prediction for their customers. Through real-time alarms and condition alerts, Tetra Pak's customers can order spare parts in a timely manner or schedule critical maintenance, predicting failures and boosting their customers' productivity. All right, great. Thank you, Rashmi. Uh, and that's running on Windows IoT Core there as well, that whole solution. That's the... Uh, the Logic controller that you saw there running Azure IoT Edge uh, on Windows IoT Core there. So I think that's a pretty good example of, of how that comes together. Okay, so now I've reached kind of the pinnacle, the top of my pyramid of needs for a commercial IoT maker. And here's where we can talk about really bringing the value of all this to a real solution that really adds significant value. I'm gonna show an industrial case, but of course this can work in many industries. So I want to announce that in the fall release of Windows, a number of key technologies are going to come together. In fact, it's almost coming off the slide because I added Intel KB Lake about an hour and a half ago. And, uh, and so these, these things are, are all coming together here. The idea is we have Azure ML, 
That's out there right now, Azure Machine Learning. It's a great place to train models and also evaluate them. We have Azure IoT Edge, which is a great way to move those modules to where they need to go at scale quickly and efficiently. We have the Windows AI platform, uh, which was released in the April update of Windows. And you know, that allows you to inference machine learning models on Windows and take advantage of the DirectX 12 compute. And any DirectX 12 compute is really the win with the Windows AI platform. You know, right now when we say compute, we're usually talking about GPUs, but as the next wave of neural processing units and vision processing units come online, no change will be needed to any solutions that we write because the Windows AI platform takes that all away, makes it abstract, and also allows many other hardware manufacturers to innovate in this space without being locked into maybe just one toolkit or one solution. Um, all that will be running on Windows IoT Core, Windows IoT Enterprise, and of course Windows Server. And the value here is that you can scale your solution depending on your needs. Now we've seen cases where someone wants to run a server and have maybe 20 or 30 IP cameras uh, being evaluated by that one server. You can use that same solution as well as if you want to have one small Windows IoT Core device that is going to reference, just, that's going to do evaluation for just one camera. It's up to you. Um, and Intel's our partner with this uh, all the way through. And so uh, they will support KB Lake on IoT Core, their seventh generation uh, for integrated graphics in the fall timeframe. And so we'll be able to run you know, pretty good quality stuff on this. So I'm going to walk through this case. This is a real customer. A real factory in Taiwan. I didn't make this stuff up. Um, our partner and ecosystem team, I think it is, uh, in Taiwan is working with Create Steel to see how the technologies that we've talked about today at Build can be used to make their factory much more efficient and make their economics much stronger and overall make Taiwan industry that much more awesome. That's the main idea that we work with them on. So Create Steel is a well-named company. They create steel. Uh, and this is, uh, the, this is the process that we're going to be zeroing in on today. This is called steel re-rolling. You can probably imagine where it gets all those names from. Uh, it's going to take the steel and turn it into a roll of the appropriate thickness and the appropriate width for the particular customer's application. So this is a real machine uh, that runs in the factory right now. There's a whole set of them. And so here I've uh, got a little video of it actually in process. This is making a fairly thin ribbon. So you can see it rolling over there on your right. On the left, I've got a close-up of the machine with a camera on it. And that camera is the same camera I'm going to show you later, only it doesn't have a, a box on it, uh, but same thing. And that sits on the machine today. And so this is all happening today. And the, the purpose of that camera is to look for defects. Now, defects in steel are regular as a normal thing. The question for a customer is, how many defects are on this roll of steel that I got? Where are they? So if I care about that, I can avoid them. Avoid them. And how severe are they? Now, all those things add up to how much do I pay for the steel? Okay. So if I want to make a stage, like imagine a steel stage here that was beautiful. I would want some high quality, low defect steel. My bar is going to be pretty high. And that's cool. We can sell that to you at a high price. And on the other end, if I'm going to build something back here that you're not going to see, I might be much more tolerant of defects. And I will take steel with more defects, just not too severe. Um, but I want to pay a little less. So the economics of my business are actually really built around defects and whether I get them right and whether I explain them to the customer correctly. So this is actually a really good problem for machine learning. What's happening today is that the steel is being analyzed using uh, custom algorithms that were handwritten by really smart people who know how to do in, uh, image processing algorithms. I don't even know how to do image processing algorithms. Um, but someone does, and these guys do it. The challenge with that is anytime you want to make a change, anytime you get new information, anytime your machine starts working a little differently, now expensive people need to get in there and do a bunch of expensive work in order to get this working right. So changing their system is really challenging. The other problem is the process stops. The, the, literally, the, the 
steel re-rolling machine has to cease operation long enough for the process to catch up because it's not as fast as we would like. So that, meanwhile, that machine is losing me money while it's just sitting there. So that's annoying. So we want this running in real time, and we want to be able to make changes to it whenever we want. Okay, that leads me to this slide. That's a great machine learning problem. So the fundamentals of machine learning are, as I'm sure you all know, because we've been talking about it constantly, is taking, we take a sample of good steel, and we say, this is good there, computer, and we take a piece of bad steel, and we take lots and lots of these, and together, uh, Azure Machine Learning, we can use that to train a model, and out comes this model we have here, who knows a good piece of steel from a bad piece of steel, without someone much smarter than me having to go in and code all that. So, this is the one slide that I hope people remember when they think about the edge, because this is the not the way to do it. <laughs> this is the anti-pattern. But we could stop now. We have a model that knows how to do this. We have a camera. We could take the entire video frame and send that up to the cloud on every machine, on every factory. We could do the evaluation there. We could send the answers back down to be pegged where they are on the steel. That has some real problems with economics. All right, so like sending those all up on all those machines, doing all that evaluation. We want to evaluate the steel about every square inch, right? So at about 10 frames a second, that is a lot of inferencing that we're paying for directly in the cloud. It just makes this not work. Um, what does make it work ta -ta, is the edge. So in this case, we work with them on taking a Windows Edge device and putting that in between. And so what's gonna happen here is the model is gonna get deployed to that edge device using Azure IoT Edge, and now the inferencing can happen right next to the camera. Uh, and now that means that we don't have to send all that up, we can do it much quick, more quickly, and of course we paid for the machines and we're maintaining those, so we have control over those costs, uh, which are super helpful. So that is how Edge makes this work. Now, we have an Azure IoT Edge-based solution, now we can add in some more solutions. We can go up on eBay, Azure Marketplace, and we can grab down another module, throw it in our system, and get all new functionality. In this case, we could decide that if a machine starts throwing off too many defects or too frequently, that we want to get an alert and we want to send that to a plant manager to get a tech down there pretty quickly to take a look. That's really easy to add in once our whole system is based on Azure IoT Edge, once our whole system is based on microservices, it's easy to throw in a new one. Super handy. Also, the advantage of Azure IoT Edge is scale. So I've shown three here because that's as much as I could fit on the slide, but this could go hundreds, thousands, all at once, one deployment of this module, every, every model, every time we want to deploy it, it can go out to as many as we need to. Big advantage there. And then the other big advantage is the ability to retrain it. So when we first did the training and said this is good, this is bad, we might not have got everything right. We might have missed a few things. Or maybe the machine started generating defects in a new way. If this happens, now what we can do is we can take and pull off a few samples from every so often. We could do that every thousand, or we could take all the defective ones, or we could take the ones that we're not really sure which way they are. We'll send those to a human. And this is called supervised learning. And so the supervisor is gonna supervise the learning. And this technician is going to look at these, and she's gonna say, well, this one's actually good, this one's actually bad. And then we'll feed that back into the Azure machine learning, and we'll retrain again test that again, and we'll get a new model that's hopefully better. And then we can deploy that back out, and now we get the benefit of the new model. The other thing that we could also do, Azure IoT Edge makes this really easy, we could set up kind of an insider program of a small set of machines, maybe far from the boss's office, where we test this out. We put out our new model, we run it in production, we give it to customers, and we see if we like it. Once we like it, we can go back into our Azure uh, portal and deploy it out to our entire force again a second time. It's just as easy no matter which way we're going to do it. So um, that's how we make Edge really be valuable for the company in the in industry. I'm going to zero in on the Windows Edge device here just for a second um, and talk about Windows advantages. Going back to the Windows AI platform, it means that it's really straightforward to find GPUs that can do this acceleration. 
uh, you know, any modern Windows PC is going to have a DirectX 12 GPU, and then later on, if the neural processing units start to come online, they can replace those machines, and the Windows AI platform needs no changes, nothing is needed, it just picks those right up. Of course, Windows has a high degree of trust in industry, I and mean, a lot of times when we talk to folks in the industry, they appreciate the security, manageability, and all those things that we talked about before of Windows. And then it's really easy to add a UI into the system. It's super simple on Windows to put that UI in there. Okay, so at this point I'm gonna do a demo. I'm gonna call Dave back this time. And we have a whole system here. So now I'm gonna show this board. And let me come over here where I can show this off. Now this board is on the expo floor. So you're welcome to go put in some steel and fiddle around with this. Uh, as much as you like. I have to turn the camera on. And you know, you'd think I'd have learned that by now, that when Dave comes up, we need the camera input. All right, awesome. OK. Uh, so over here, this is a, a cover for a camera, just like the one we showed you on the machine. This is a special industrial camera that's being used. Underneath, I have a place where I can put a piece of steel. And so this is a sample of steel from a factory. And this one actually has a few defects on it. You may not be able to see it now, uh, but in a bit we'll show that. So I can just pop that right in there, which I'll do in a second. That's connected to, right now, this is a, an industrial PC running Windows 10 IoT Enterprise. Uh, in the fall release, this could be replaced with a Windows 10 IoT Core device as well. Um, and then up on top, I have a panel which has some UI on it that we're actually using really for demo purposes and to, to see inside the system and understand what's going on here. But this could also be used to be actually put onto the machine itself so that an operator can easily come by and, and see how the machine is doing. Or this could be in the plant manager's office to get kind of a greater view um, of what's going on. So that's the system. I'm gonna switch over now directly to this panel so that you can see what, we, what I see when I work with it. So thank you, Dave. And now, let's get the right input. Super, okay. So, if I can do this without falling off stage, it will be awesome. All right, let's try this one. Stick this guy in. Now, I will say this is a, a prototype, so please don't judge the performance, right? This has not been put into actual action. Uh, so this one looks pretty good. I can see that, uh, on um, the left-hand side, I have the actual camera image. And on the right-hand side, I've classified each square inch of this. And that all looks pretty good. That is all green. So that's great. Let's try this guy. All right, so this is one that has a few more scratches on it. And, uh, but some uh, other things are not judged to be quite so severe on that. Now. Okay, so this looks good. The experiment that I like to do, and this works about 50-50 because I'm not always that awesome at it, is I'm gonna try to defect the steel right here while we're talking and get some good defects on there. <laughs> Tony, do you think this is gonna work? <laughs> yeah, he gives me the thumbs up, so he thinks this is gonna work. Find the defects. No, I'm afraid not. It only caught just a little bit of defect on the edge, so. That is apparently not a severe enough defect to warrant a problem in this case, or maybe we have to retrain it. Um, <laughs> we'll check back after retraining. Okay, so now let's have a look at this piece again. So this is a real life case where, if you notice on the lower left of this piece of steel, it's got a, a little dot, like a, like a, a little nail a hole or something there. And what happened here, when this model was originally trained, this defect wasn't known. So this defect started happening later. Uh, and so uh, what we do need to do is we need to realize there's a problem with this and send it back for retraining. And so uh, this sample gets sent out to the operator. An operator can just kind of take and, and pause the real camera for a second. And could come in here, for example, and retrain this and say, OK, actually, that's bad, and that's bad too. Um, and then could update that. 
And so now what's happened here is that the system would, that we would write here would queue up all of these retrainings into a batch that many time, many people may have done a batch or may have many, collected many retraining pieces of data. Great. Um, and so now what will happen is, I'll come back to this, we'll resume. Okay, and now what's going to happen is a data scientist is going to then take these, and what she'll do is she'll take all these back, back into the Azure Machine Learning Workbench, which we'll show you in a second, retrain these, and publish out a new deployment. Now, for the, our demo purposes, I don't want to run through all that, so we added some UI in here to just get a new model. So let's get that model. Of course, this would happen with no real user input in real life, but this isn't real life, it's a demo. Uh, so now I'm going to stick this back in using our new model. And I'll turn the camera on. I'll cross my fingers. Right. And so now this one got correctly classified as uh, being a defect in here. And now my business goes on being more effective and is able to really throw these out there as defects. So that's kind of an example of how this would look from a real life. Um, at this point... Am I ready for Tony? Yes. All right, so now I'm going to ask Tony to come up. Um, and, uh, and Tony is actually uh, the one who did all the work to put the demo together. And he works in our uh, Taiwan Partner and Ecosystem Office. Is that right? Okay, I got that right. Uh, and so what I've asked Tony to do is he's going to kind of take us through the behind the scenes so that we can see what's happening when this model is built and trained uh, originally, and now I'll get you over here. You are six. All right, there you okay. go. And that's okay. Okay. Thank you, James. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I will introduce how to retrain the model based on the uh, images we class, class uh, gathered and uh, relabeled according to the introduction James just done. So we got uh, some mechanical experts to reclassify the uh, material, the steel surface. And once we collect those data, we split the data into two parts. So I, here I have two folders. One is the training folder, another is the testing folder. So each folder has two subfolders. One is the normal folder, which collects the normal steel images. Another one is the abnormal one, or the defect one, which collects the uh, defect images of the steel surfaces. So we can use those uh, collected uh, images to retrain our model. OK, so let's get back to the uh, work, uh, Azure machine learning. So this is our project. We have a project to use the deep neural network to train our images. As James mentioned, this is uh, supervised learning. So we have the labeled image, images uh, prepared, and we will use uh, the cognitive toolkit, CNDK, to do the retraining. OK, so in every machine learning, we can use the command prompt here to retrain the model. So we can run the Python code to help retrain the model. So in the Python code, it will do some images rescaling first, and then do some image uh, converting uh, so that it can convert the images to the uh, format that uh, CNTK can understand. At that time, we can also use the VS Code, Visual Studio Code, to, to see uh, what's going on in our uh, model generation. So here, uh, we build a deep neural network model with CNTK, the cognitive toolkit here. Then, since it's an uh, image classification problem, so we use the uh, convolutional neural network to 
work on this uh, experiment. So uh, here we use two levels of convolution layer. So we start from a first convolution layer and uh, followed by a pooling layer. Then we have the second convolution layer here and followed by a pooling layer here. And we will end up with a dense layer. So it's a general uh, convolutional neural network model. And you can adjust the layers and in, uh, add some more layers if you want. And you can do some uh, adding the convolution layer and the pooling layer and do some adjustment if you want. And finally, we use the CNTK and we can uh, generate a model and save the model in different formats. So for CNTK, we save the model as a, a CNTK model, and then we save it as another different kinds of format, the Open Neural Network Exchange format, the Onyx format. So this is uh, quite uh, popular, and we mentioned uh, several times of the Onyx format model uh, in the build event. Okay, and you can take the advantage of Onyx format model uh, in the Windows platform. Okay, so let's get back to the command prompt here. So after several iterations, uh, you, it generates the model for you. And as you can see, uh, the uh, error rate is decreased over the iteration. So I think uh, this uh, model is good enough for me now. So this is the uh, rebuilt model. And then I go to go back to the Azure Machine Learning to see the uh, results. Okay, so here we have the uh, classification results. As you can see, this is a project I ran some experience before. Uh, we have some results uh, here. And this is the latest one I just ran. I select this one and I can see some of the logs here. So for example, this is the uh, printout results I just mentioned. And then we saved, the, uh, as we just mentioned in the VS Code, uh, this model saved uh, in two different kinds of formats. One is the uh, CNTK format, another one is the Onyx format. So I can select the Onyx model here and select download uh, to, to, uh, to save the Onyx model in my computer. Then I can also visualize the uh, Onyx model, like the one he mentioned here. So you can see this is the Onyx model and it's generated by CNTK, the Cognitive Toolkit. And it has several layers, starting from a convolution layer, and we have a, a pooling layer, and followed by another convolution layer and another pooling layer. So this uh, visualizes the model we just generated. And I can, uh, get, I can save this Onyx model and uh, deploy the model to, the, our, to our solution. So let's get back to James. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Tony. That, that's awesome. It's a good thing he did that, because I would not be able to. Um, all right, cool, so that is our demo. Uh, and so we're pretty much wrapped up on the talk here. And yellow light is on, so I know it's time to start wrapping it up. Uh, so just a couple of things for you to follow up on here. Uh, you can learn more. Uh, we have an IoT show. Uh, in fact, there was a little blurb for us on that. And uh, this is content regularly refreshed while it's going on at Microsoft IoT. Strongly suggest uh, to uh, subscribe to that stuff and check that out. Good things there. IoT School is spinning up as well. So there are a lot of kind of hands-on tutorials and labs to learn how to do these things. And so you can kind of dig into those more deeply there. Uh, and then uh, there are still yet three more sessions at Build. We talked about Eustace and Torsten's session about security. And then, of course, uh, Galen and his crew are going to talk about Azure Sphere, which is awesome. Uh, and then Corey and Tim are going to kind of get into details on the solutions themselves and, and how you can do great things with Azure there. So um, I have a few more minutes to take questions. 
Um, and so I think actually uh, the probably the most efficient way is going to be for me to wrap up here, and then I'll uh, bring Tony and Shrog and myself, and maybe Jason will join us over here, and we'll do uh, questions off to the side. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time and effort coming out here, and enjoy the rest of your build. Thank you.